Hello, and welcome to the 13th annual Michigan State University Comics Forum. My name is Ryan Clater. I'm the professor of the Comics Studio courses in the MSU Department of Art, Art History and Design, and I'm the director of this event. Before we get started, I wanted to give the stage to a sister comics event here in the Lansing area called the Capital City Comic Con. Michigan State University partners with this event to create a pretty exciting opportunity for one deserving MSU comics minor student. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming the Capital City Comic Con owners, Tim Hunt and Brian Harris. Hi everybody, I'm Brian Harris, this is Tim Hunt. I'm getting too far away from my mouth. And we're Capital City Comic Con. Uh, every year, we have our, oops, I hit the wrong button. Sorry, we're getting oriented here. We've got too many computers. So every year we work with uh, the university to help one student. So to do that, we have our mission, uh, which is the, the four C's of, uh, of our company, which is comics, creators, communities, and collectibles. So to put that together, uh, and to connect with our, our, uh, you know, our local community and the university and where we came from. Tim's a alumni. I'm an alumni. The other people that uh, helped start the company and worked with us originally were were alumni. We're all part of the Spartan community, and so we want to uh, make sure that we help uh, Spartan and that we want to help the comics uh, culture in general move forward. So our convention is creator focused. We try to make sure that we uh, uh, put forth the culture of writers and artists and uh, the developers of the comic art above everything else. Um, again, community driven. We work with the Capillary Literacy Coalition as well as a scholarship to make sure that we have connections everywhere to make sure that we are trying to be more than just a company trying to profit off of comics. Um, as recognition of that, uh, we have been honored by the uh, uh, Greater Lansing Convention and Visitors Bureau as a champion of the community. Uh, it's a award that uh, the Convention and Visitors Bureau gives to a select number of companies in the region who have been shown to be uh, significant contributors to, to the local communities. Last year, our winner was Laura Root, who's here with us. This is her piece, which, uh, you know, I have to say was one of my favorite pieces. <laughs> so, uh, so what's the scholarship? We talked about it. It's a thousand dollar scholarship. Uh, it helps uh, students uh, with their art, with the process, not only just um, uh, to, uh, you know, financially, but also with the process of, of the comic book creation process and, and in the industry. So why do we do it? We already went over that a bit. Um, it's only for MSU students in the graphic arts program. Uh, it's for students that show outstanding uh, acumen with the art of comic books. Um, and again, it's to help it's to help artists get to the next level to try and help them uh, become the next best thing. Uh, let's see. Again, Laura's great. So a little bit about Laura. Uh, she was our fourth recipient. Uh, she's created a great comic book, which helped her win the award called uh, Hamlet is Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which I really like to read, which is why I voted for her on the committee. Uh, and it's a modern adaptation of various Shakespeare's plays, and I really recommend that you guys go and uh, check it out on her website, uh, lemonbrows.com. So the scholarship includes, we mentioned a couple times, it's a commission contract for $1,000. Uh, you get a commemorative certificate. 
Uh, special guest uh, status at our convention, which includes a booth to sell their art. Uh, uh, professional highlight is a special guest and uh, invitation to produce, participate in, uh, in panel discussions with uh, uh, you know, members of the community, attendees, and other artists in attendance. Also, we try, we feature the winners in uh, press releases, uh, promotional materials, other marketing uh, advertisements as well. Uh, we also print uh, uh, copies of the art that we commission uh, in order to, and then make those available for sale in order to help fund the scholarship in the future. To apply, our, the application's on our website, or we can be emailed for any eligible students. Uh, students who are eligible, you can always talk to Ryan. Uh, members who of the uh, MSU Comics Arts minor, is that right? Close enough, Close enough yes. Uh, and uh, applications are submitted via email. Applications are due by April 15th, and uh, the final uh, winners will be notified by May 15th. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions for us while we're standing here? Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, it'll be Friday, uh, September 11th, and Saturday, September 12th. What do you got? It's going to be at the Summit Sports and Ice Arena on the uh, west side of Lansing. All right, so we're moving off campus this year, growing up. <laughs> Any other questions? At the 30 second rule, usually it shakes out one. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. No? Tim and Brian, thank you very much for outlining this extraordinary opportunity for one of Michigan State University's comic students. Uh, as they mentioned, they have done this for four years. This is their fifth year. So uh, thank you for your half decade of commitment to fostering comic artists in our area. Uh, I'd also like to uh, take a moment to recognize the campus and community entities who through their contributions, allow each one of us to be here now and through the week enjoying all of the events associated with the MSU Comics Forum absolutely free of charge. And I'd like to start with the bronze sponsors like the Michigan State University Comic Art and Graphic Novel Podcast, which airs monthly throughout the academic year and interviews professional cartoonists. BRD Printing, who did the immaculate job of printing Emile's uh, 2020 MSU Comics Forum posters and has done so for a dozen years straight now. Thank you, BRD. The Residential College in the Arts and Humanities. And the MSU Library's Special Collections, home of the largest public collection of comic books in the world. Silver sponsors include Matrix, the Center for Digital Humanities and Social Sciences, MSU Muslim Studies, who annually contributes to the Comics Forum by having a comic book reading discussion and lecture, Gary Hoppenstand, an extraordinary professor who has been a supporter of comics and the Comics Forums since its inception, and the gold sponsors, which include Michigan State University Libraries, where we are all sitting right now and where all of the events are taking place over the course of this weekend. The Journal of Popular Culture, the MSU Department of English, the Department of Art, Art History, and Design, which houses the Michigan State University Comic Art and Graphic Novel minor course of study, which is an interdisciplinary minor between the art and English departments at MSU. And finally, our platinum sponsor is the College of Arts and Letters. And if you are interested in becoming a sponsor, you can contact me at director MSUCF for Michigan State University Comics Forum at gmail.com. 
So uh, a little earlier, I mentioned my role as the director of this event, but I can guarantee you that the Michigan State University Comics Forum would not look like it does without a lot of help from the MSU Comics Forum Committee. So please join me in thanking each one of these folks with a round of applause, starting with our venue liaison, Jonah Magar. who is busy live streaming the event right now. So Jonah, give us a big wave. Thank you, Jonah. Then James Curtis is our promotions coordinator. So if you heard about this event, yes. It's likely because of James. Uh, James lives a couple hours north of here, so he wasn't able to get down here tonight, but he will be here tomorrow. Uh, but thank you for the round of applause anyway. Maybe he's watching on live stream. Hi, James. Anthony Robinson is our Faithful Artist Alley Coordinator. Anthony Robinson yeah. <laughs> has put together a tremendous roster of artists which will be displaying their work tomorrow throughout the day on Saturday. Zach Cruzy, Panel Coordinator. who has made it his mission to build the academic portion of this conference. Uh, I think it's quadrupled or quintupled since Zach started, quintupled, thank you. <laughs> since he started working with the MSU Comics Forum, so I cannot overstate Zach's influence on the show. Zach, thank you for not only growing the show with me, but also being my rock whenever I need to talk about the show with somebody who understands. <laughs> Also, uh, and there's Zach, look at him, so handsome. <laughs> Julian Chambliss, our associate panel coordinator, who is a relatively new hire in the English department, <laughs> who has absolutely hit the ground running. He moved from sunny Florida to sunny Michigan to <laughs> become a part of comic studies and much more on campus. So Julian, thank you so much for your involvement. And Sharif Abu Saud, our webmaster. Uh, as you can see from a number of these pictures, we have several working dads on our committee, and Sharif was unable to be here tonight as well. Uh, but hello on live stream, Sharif, and thank you for making our website so accessible. Um, and I'm Ryan Clater, and together we make up the MSU Comics Forum Committee. So let's give these guys a round of applause. <laughs> Finally, before I introduce the person that you're here to see, I also wanted to take a moment to recognize some pretty massive shoulders that we all stand on here at Michigan State University. Randy Scott, could you stand up for a moment, please? Can I say something about this hat? Let's hear it. So, Randy, when I proposed the Michigan State University Comic Art and Graphic Novel Podcast minor, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Graphic Novel minor course of study, uh, I'm not so sure it would have been as well received without the decades of effort and your hard work and humble nature in the MSU Special Collections as comics bibliographer. So Randy Scott, if you're not aware, is the focal point of Emile's immaculately illustrated poster design for the 2020 Comics Forum. And with good reason, as he's the person who has assembled and cataloged through decades of dedication, the largest public collection of comic books in the world. So Randy Scott, thank you for blazing this trail for sco uh, comic scholarship for all of us here at Michigan State University, as well as countless scholars and artists who have traveled both nationally and internationally to use this world-renowned resource that you have created. So please, if everyone would, wouldn't mind standing with me to thank Randy for his unparalleled accomplishment, a resource to which he still contributes to this day.
Randy, if I haven't embarrassed you enough, can I ask you to come up here for a second, please? <laughs> so last year, we had a lifetime achievement ceremony for you, where you heard from a great number of voices, both young and established, friends and family, from librarians to comic scholars, artists and publishers, all talking about the tremendous contribution you've made and continue to make to the field of comic studies. At that ceremony, we also publicly, publicly revealed Emile's 2020 Comics Forum Randy Scott tribute artwork for the first time. And now I'd like to give you the first card, a limited run of commemorative gifts that we've created this year. This Randy Scott card is actually a USB card that will be given out to the artists and scholars participating in our artist alley and academic panel discussions taking place tomorrow throughout the day. So moving forward, there will be about 100 comic scholars and artists who will be thinking fondly of you and your legacy as they save their important documents <laughs> on your face. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. <laughs> Is finally. <laughs> You're free to go. <laughs> all right. Thank you for bearing with me as I mention all these important people. Uh, but now, for the most important person of the evening, we are excited to hear from our esteemed keynote speaker, Emil Ferris. Emil is an American writer, cartoonist, and designer. In 2017, she debuted her widely lauded graphic novel, My Favorite Thing is Monsters, a coming of age story about a girl growing up in 1960s Chicago. The book is written and drawn in the form of the character's notebook. My Favorite Thing is Monsters was heralded as a masterpiece by Forbes and the AV Club, and at the start of 2020 was named one of the most important comics of the past decade by The Guardian. Her awards are numerous, so I'll mention only a few here, but her work has garnered the 2017 Ignatz Award for Outstanding Graphic Novel for My Favorite Thing is Monsters, uh, the 2018 Eisner Award for Best Writer Artist, the 2019 Grand Prize for Best Comic of the Year at Angoulême International Comics Festival, and at the risk of making uh, this introduction any longer or further embarrassing our keynote speaker, I'll cut it short there, and uh, I can't think of a better person to help us celebrate our lucky 13th year. So please join me in giving a warm Michigan State University welcome to, I can't believe I get to say this, Emil Ferris. Thank you, Ryan. I don't think I'm, uh, am I hooked up here? Am I, are you able to hear me loudly? No, I think I'm just regular. Hold on a second here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Zach, what should I do? By the way, thank you for that uh, warm welcome. I really appreciate it. But uh, I do. It's right here. And it's on. But I think it's off up there. And I don't know what to do there. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. OK, then I'm good. Then I'm good. All right. Um, let me see here. I also have to do something else here. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. I'm technologically uh, inept, but uh, I'm doing my best. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're there. We're, we're happening. Okay, I'm going to put this bad boy over here. And um, thank you so much. You know, I, sometimes when I'm working on forthcoming material, I, uh, I, through this period, I have felt like I could feel your... Um, existence. I could feel people reading the book. Isn't that weird? And the book was a creating substance. It was kind of like something from the Matrix. I mean, it was becoming more real because you entered the world of the book and you gave it the greatest gift that any writer can ask for. I'm going to get emotional. I'm sorry. You gave it your brilliant, multifaceted imaginations. And I really want to thank you for that. I didn't know when I was making it that anyone 
would ever read it. So this is enormous. It's such a gift. So thank you. Um, you know, I should make a non-country uh, statement, and I always forget to do that, and it's wrong. Um, uh, you know, this, the land that we're on is likely once the land, and uh, sadly, we owe a debt to the Fox, the Sauk, the Kickapoo, the Menominee, the Miami, and the Ojibwe, and probably the Potawatomi as well. We have some in Illinois. And so I just want to say uh, to them, I'm sorry, and thank you. Thank you that we're able to be here. Um, so, and, and hello. Uh, there's a child here, so I can't swear. And I'm, but I can't guarantee. And I also want to say another thing, a little trigger warning. I might talk about something. Uh, I might talk a little bit about sexual abuse, so you know that. And um, there is one slide in, a, in among all of these that is um, exceptional. Now, if there's anyone here that feels that they would be really offended by seeing something rather subtle but explicit in the world of nudity, um, is there anyone that would be deeply offended? OK, I'm not seeing anybody. Oh, for a second, I thought I did. I was going to be like, <laughs> OK, all right. Um, so uh, this is the monster talk. This is the diagram of what's going to be happening now. So you get, oh, I get to do a pointer, which I love this. OK, so uh, you get, um, this is my guy right here. And I'm kind of, he's kind of laboratory created. And he, you know, my travels, history, and then tall tales, because, you know, I'm probably, I might, I might tell you, I might lie. I don't know. <laughs> I, I probably won't, but if I, I, it's almost impossible for me to keep lying. I might lie a little bit and then tell you I'm lying. Um, what some call pseudoscience, but I call magic, you know, which I think is completely acceptable, right? Um, musings, amusements, and museums, all having the root word of muse, which I think is really interesting. Uh, digressions and asides. You've probably already figured out that that would uh, be um, actually this uh, largest portion of everything. Uh, art stuff, and then stuff about monsters, which you knew anyway. And uh, the history, you know, little weird quirky things, some throwaway bonus things that you didn't know about. Um, and the naughty bits, uh, nudie pictures and curse words, it could happen, but it probably won't. Um, so I'm going to try really hard. And so you know I love these guys. And um, I can't credit the artist whose work this is, although I wish I could. Uh-oh, well, hello. Uh, but they do that to you. They make the lights go out, don't they? I mean, and in a good way, because Whitney uh, and I were talking about um, monsters and how it's in that darkness that you find so much. And that was, you know, so it was in this darkness that I found a six-year-old child, five actually, I started watching Creature Features, and I fell in love with this woman right here, first of all. And I will tell you why. And of course, I then fell in love with uh, this gentleman. And you know, I mean, of course. You know, there were, there were many, uh, and I will tell you. And it, you know, these are my parents. So, so this <laughs> that kind of explains something. And let me tell you a little bit about these people. Um, my, um, my mother is an amazing painter. Uh, she is just the most exceptional figurative painter uh, of surrealism, a surrealistic uh, kind of work. And uh, very, very, uh, my mother exhibited to me the Alice Neal saying that it, it, for a woman to stay making art, she must have the will of the devil. And I don't mean that in a negative way. But she had this tenacity that to this day, as old as she is, she paints every day. And this is what my parents taught me, is to work and to work and to work. Um, this gentleman, though, was a joker. And uh, he, um, my father, uh, he was a city boy. Now, my mother, of course, she was from rural Las Vegas, not the nice one, Las Vegas, New Mexico. She was from a ranch. It's not that ranch. This is a lie. That is just <laughs> something I pulled off the internet. That's so rude. But it looked something like this. Of course, there were orchards and you know cows and things. Um, but you know the town of self of, uh, of uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico is rather depressed. And her father was a small town uh, lawyer. And he said, she said, I want to go to art school, which nobody did. So um, he said, well, draw up a uh, amicus brief. Or he draw up a proposal to, uh, to, to tell me that you're really serious about this. So she did. 
She drew up a proposal and presented it to him in his office in front of his big desk, and he reviewed it, you know, judiciously, and then he decided that she could go to school. Now, my father, on the other hand, was from this place, 71st and Stony Island in Chicago, which my father would have said more like this, 71st and Stony Island in Chicago, okay? <laughs> and he was an immigrant, uh, son of an immigrant, uh, an Arab immigrant, um, who was a furrier. My first monsters were the furs in the abandoned shop. And I would, as a very small infant, because we, um, I lived above the shop on 71st and Stony Island, I would go down with my parents, and I had touched these beautiful, beautiful dead things that hung in the darkness. And I, I have a sense about that being something that I loved. Well, my father um, should have been in the mob. He was sort of on his way into the mafia. Uh, and it was art that saved him. What happened is that, I don't know if you know what eight pagers are. Okay, you do. I saw some hands, so, oh yeah, oh yeah, Randy's like, <laughs> now that's what I need to see. I gotta tell you honestly. Um, I'm gonna take this off because I'm getting hot, but no, I'm not, I've got this. Okay, so I'll just be hot. Um, he made eight pagers at Morgan Park Academy, which is a military school that he went he was at, and he was uh, attending with uh, the sons of mafiosa. Uh, uh, and so one day, he was making this as a business. He would run them off on the mimeograph machine and then sell them for a quarter. And this is how he was paying for things. Well, one got stuck in the mimeograph machine and was found by the administration. And they figured out who did it. And so he was about to be expelled and the art teacher saw it. And she really felt that his um, representation of um, Mickey's phallus was very good. <laughs> and she said, give him to me. And that saved him. Um, my father told me with tears in his eyes that he hated beating people up that he didn't want to be a mobster, and that that was certainly going to be his future. Uh, what he did instead is he got a scholarship to the Art Institute of Chicago. And that's where he went, yeah. And I, I, that changed my life, too, because these two crazy fools met there at the Art Institute of Chicago. And somewhere in that building, they made me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and my mother's famous sa statement was, um, her famous statement was, uh, she came up to my father and she said, um, you know, uh, if you stretch my canvas, I'll clean your brushes. <laughs> so, this is, uh, I don't know if any of you ever played Tapper. Okay. Well, my father was the inspiration for the bartender in Tapper. Uh, big, big Mike, the bartender. Uh, he had taught the man that invented Tapper how to do a lot of things. And so this man honored him by creating that character. Um, now this is the nice one, the one that I can show you. I mean, nice, I'm so wrong, I'm so wrong. Forgive me, I'm so being such a boomer. Um, I'm, I, I, I wanted to <coughs> talk to you a little bit, and I think we skipped something here, did we? Did we? Oh yes, we did. These are my parents, yet again, uh, and that person who looks really not well, that's me. Um, <laughs> so you saw the eye and the eye. I combined them to create what well, unfortunately we're calling a Venn diagram now, which is so wrong. It is actually the vesica pisces, okay? And that's what this symbol is. And it's a very ancient symbol, and it's really important. Um, so I'm, here I'm supposed to check with you and look around for children, but the child is playing. So we're just gonna, <laughs> we're just gonna go to that one, okay? Um, this is the vesica pisces. Now what happens with the vesica pisces? Out of the vesica pisces, comes every single shape that you can imagine. This is how everything is created, from right in there. And this is the flower of life. This is the pattern that is actually in our DNA. So when you combine multiples of these, you get this, and this is our DNA. So you begin to see that we are living in a unified world. It is, it is very cohesive. Now, we've, forever we've had Madonnas, but hello. Um, <laughs> 
this is, you know, what is a Madonna? It's a yoni, essentially. And here is a particular saint, can't remember which one, having an interaction with this, you know. So there we are. And um, why am I telling you about that? Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I am going to say that here's the Vesica Pisces being co-opted by all of our, um, you know, and this is, this is a great book, A Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe which I would recommend to you. So here in Angoulême, here is Jesus coming out of the Vesica Pisces. Because the Vesica Pisces is a way of talking about transvi transitioning from one world to another, okay? It's a way of saying, essentially, I'm leaving this world and going into another, or I'm coming from this world. Um, so here is a flower being essentially laid out within the Vesica Pisces. And here is a fly. Our whole world is affected by this one thing. The, the Greeks did not actually have one and two. One and two were not even considered numbers. Three was the actual number. One and two were considered mother and father. Isn't that interesting? So, um, oh, here we go. And this I did for forthcoming material before I even really knew that, in fact, we have the Vatican. This is in the Vatican. And our, uh, our uh, this pope gentleman here, positions our presidents in front of this painting. <laughs> but it's a very interesting thing, because if you know what this is, then you know that this is death. So this is death, and it, you, know, you see this means that everything above this is life, and all that is below this is death, because this is essentially the anus, uh, when you know what that is. And so then you look at these pictures, and they make a different picture for you. Um, <laughs> so uh, here's the flower of life. Right? And this is a picture I took going into the Louvre when I recently had a residency there. And this is, if you turned this into a 3D thing, it would be this. So you're walking through the flower of life to enter the Louvre, or a lot of churches, too. And let me see if I can, uh, isn't that interesting? So there it is. This is the above, this is the below. So as above, so below. And that's our beautiful Notre Dame, unfortunately. This man is Nassim Harriman, who is a physicist, Swiss physicist. And this is, believe it or not, this is water, which has had light vibrationally pass through it. Isn't that remarkable? And it is all of it uh, related to the Vesic Pisces and shapes that you'd find there. So Nikola Tesla was correct when he said, our entire biological system, the brain and the Earth itself, work on the same frequencies. Isn't that amazing? He and Einstein both said, essentially, that when the human spirit was researched, the greatest uh, advances would be made in science. So we're coming to that time. A lot of people are not so sure about that. So here's Nassim Harriman's um, a, a representation of his unified field theory, that all of these things are related. I'll move through it because, uh, and then, if you do not like your current reality, then you must change both your thinking and your emotional um, misperceptions to change your vibration. Vibration is a vital key to changing your destiny. When I tell you about myself, I'm going to be telling you about vibration. Uh, the final key is uh, that, uh, that unlocks doorways to a greater life. The power to change your own destiny is in your hands and no one else's. I really believe that. Um, so these are, uh, Dr. Masuro Amoto did these experiments with water where he took water and um, it was prayed over by Tibetan uh, priests. And so you see the water was then frozen and crystallized. These are the words that were said over the water. This is what, uh, and I kind of like that one. I mean, it's a monster, but it is a polluted specimen. So um, let me see here. That's him. And that's more polluted water. And then that's the same water after it's been prayed over. Um, OK. There we are. The ancient Egyptians really understood this magic. And why am I talking to you about this magic, right? Why am I doing that? What are we talking about? We're talking about words and images. Because that symbolism is what is so important. These people here. The Egyptians understood that words and pictures were magic. Why? 
Why are they magic? Because you're, you're, you're engaging with both hemispheres of the brain. That's why it's so powerful. That's why it's the future. Okay? And uh, I almost said F you, Mrs. Connor, because, you know, of so many people that have told me that couldn't be. Uh, the combination of text and image is ancient magic. It really is. This is the magic we're doing. Uh, okay. So uh, this is some more stuff about, and you know, I'm kind of moving through, but this is more about the, the, the sense of the triangle. The triangle, which you can build a beautiful one if you have a vesica pisces and you need one to build it. Um, the triangle is something really important in my work. Really early in the book, I talk about triangulation. Uh, you probably read that. And triangulation is not going to stop being important in the forthcoming material. So uh, there's our, our friend, my friend. Um, so I drew a little diagram, just a sneak peek, uh, a little diagram of what I'm doing. So I very intentionally triangulate almost all the time. And you can find those triangulations. And my theory of triangulation, Dees puts it forward early in the book. He says that the vulnerable party, she is the vulnerable party, is going to be at a pivot point in this triangulation. This is uh, the, the entity in this, di in this diagram, this, in the story, who, uh, hair shoots, who has power. So depending on what he does here with this point, it's going to affect her. And then, of course, we have this direct line right there. And here's the other thing. Hidden pictures are really important in my book. You probably have found a lot of them. But here's one right here. It's a devil. And it is, it's mirroring uh, his face. It's in the wood. You have to pass. Your eyes do take in all of these things. And they pass through this. And you don't necessarily know that you've seen it. It's important that you don't necessarily know that you've seen it. That's so wrong, isn't it? <laughs> I'm such a bad person when I realize when I think about it. Um, and then there's another one right up here that has sort of a little Hitler mustache and kind of is almost a clown, but is also not, is rather menacing. So that's throughout the book. Now you have to go back and look, right? And then in forthcoming material, you'll see Mama. And she's once again standing in front of the Vesica Pisces. And, um, not quite sure she wants to go yet. Sorry I spoiled the book for you if you, if you haven't read it yet. I, it was a, so then here they are, my parents. And what they don't know about that person is that her feet aren't going to grow at all until she is almost um, three years old. And because of that, she's not going to be able to walk. And she didn't. She didn't walk until she was nearly three. Well, what did that do? That's kind of tragic, right? I mean, this is going to be like the story of how I fell in a million holes. Um, it really is. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it meant that I had to sit in the middle of the room and draw because I couldn't do what kids do. You know how they, they do that, like walk up to things to touch them? I could never do that. And that's a developmental thing. I think you crave the ability to do that. You, you crave it. And I couldn't. So what I did, luckily I had wonderful parents who made a little studio for me in the middle of the floor with everything that I needed to draw. So I could have still life set up for me, and I could look at things, and I could draw everything. I drew everything. You know. So um, why do I tell you about this? Embrace the magic of your unique misfortunes. That's really an important thing to know to do. There are always going to be them. And you have a special story. You have a story nobody else has. And you have things that you will accomplish despite the fact that you are going to be challenged and probably already have been in your life. Um, so this is actually uh, where I grew up in Uptown. This is 833 Buena. We didn't, we, even the Hispanic kids called it Buena. We didn't call it Buena, called it Buena. And Eugene will know this. I mean, um, and this is where I tell you Karen is. I, I cooked down the life quite a bit because this building was so full of life. I, I mean, I sat on the floor and ate off of leaves with one of my friends. And then I had Haitian food with another. And then I had, you know, and I had Native American friends. And I had all kinds of friends. And so this building was my window to the world. 
Uh, but it was also a very dangerous place to live because we couldn't go beside the windows at night because somebody was usually shooting and we'd get shot if a profile showed up. So uh, Uptown was a dangerous place. Um, this was my first love as a painting. And this painting is called uh, Village of the Sirens. So you, my father brought me to the Art Institute and he loved that place. That was his, his place. So he would take me there and he would just sort of shove me towards paintings like you would shove a kid towards a rich uncle. Get to know them, you know, get to know them. It'll be good for you. And um, this was the first one. And I saw this and all of them, they kind of looked like my mother and they were so beautiful. And then I looked a little closer and I realized the secret of this painting. And somehow, because there were prostitutes and um, uh, in the neighborhood that I grew up, there was a way that there was a domestication to these figures that really sparked a kind of uh, a response, an early feminist response to this painting. Um, but you do see that these are mermaids. I'm not, uh, I, okay, I'm so blind, I wouldn't be seeing that. Here it says, you can look at a uh, picture for a week and never think of it again, or you can also look at the picture for a second and think of it all your life. I think of this painting every day of my life. I, I, it just was a lot to me. This is maybe the second painting I fell in love with. And if you haven't figured it out by now, my father and Dee's are sort of similar. Um, this, uh, this painting explained to me his nature, which could be extremely violent and, and also very tender and uh, very cultured and very brutal all at the same time. And I spent a lot of time walking the city with that father of mine. Um, this was maybe one of my third loves, and this actually hangs not far from here. Do you know that you have, as Michiganders, you have this painting? It's, it's your painting. It hangs in the Detroit Institute of Art, which is a tremendous. I'm jealous. I'm so jealous. Um, I just, I completely enjoyed this painting in so many ways. And when I found out that it inspired this woman, who uh, at 18 changed the entire world, by creating a genre, by writing a book that changed the world and created a genre. And here she is talking, and I don't have my glasses on. What does she say? She says, I do know that for the sympathy of, all, of one living being, this is her speaking as Frankenstein, I would make peace with all. I have love in me the likes of which you can scarcely imagine, and rage the likes of which you would not believe. If I cannot satisfy the one, I will indulge the other. I did a piece. Um, which was for noisemakers, which was a great opportunity to talk about uh, Mary Shelley. She was not, her mother died, a very famous author, died when she was a few days old. And then she was raised by a stepmother who really kind of hated her and did not support her in any way. Uh, so she went through tremendous hell as a human being. And I wanted to talk about that because, let's be honest, not all of us uh, get on with our parents, you know? And sometimes it's, uh, it's nice when we find out that there's a way to survive that. Um, so I fell in love with her. The producers of the movie, Bride of Frankenstein, did a fantastic thing. They were told, you have to cut Elsa Lanchester as Mary Shelley out of the beginning of the movie. We don't want that. We just want the story about Bride of Frankenstein. And they, this one particular producer said, no, no. And because that producer said no to this essentially misogynist request to just take away the fact that this book actually came from a woman, I became a writer. Because I saw this and I said, huh. Now Mrs. Connor in kindergarten had two stacks of papers. The stack for the boys had everything. President, you know, doctor, policeman, fireman, businessman, everything. The sack for the girls had secretary, nurse, teacher, mother. Writer was in the stack for the boys. And then I saw this and I was like, I believe in Mrs. Connor. <laughs> I can be a writer and I can be a monster. And it seemed to me there was not a whole lot of difference. Um, and I understood. And then it was so sexy. Being a monster is just like, and we talked about this, didn't we? It is the sexiest thing in the world. Monsters are sexy. This was my early sex education. Um, yeah. Now, I love this line above her head, don't you? Uh, she gives you that weird feeling. Well, can I tell you she gave me that weird feeling? Um, 
I just fell in love with her. And there is a scene, as you know, if you've read my book and maybe even seen this movie, where she and the woman she's kidnapped almost kiss. They, I think they cut out the fact that in the movie, the way they filmed it, they did, or they were quite intimate. Uh, I, I imagine that. I don't know if it's true. Anyway, that was a lie. Uh, that was one of my lies. Um, here we are. I cried. I wept. I couldn't be. I was unconsolable when I uh, when he was killed. At the, I'm sorry. I'm spoiling that for you in case you have never seen it. He is killed at the end, and I wept copiously because I was. Uh, what is your werewolf name? I don't. <laughs> I, don't I enjoy these so much. I, uh, do you do these when you when they come up? They're just uh, very enjoyable. Uh, I don't know. And uh, there you are. That's uh, me. Now, um, when I was. Uh, 10 years old, my scoliosis, what was what the cause of my feet never growing, um, I needed surgery because I was told when I was eight that um, my spine was going to run into my heart by the time I was 30 and I wouldn't make it past 30, which considering that I'd read about Shelley Byron, and, and all of them, I was like, well, you know, that's so perfect. <laughs> I mean, none of the greats make it past 30, I guess I die. And, um, but then they came up with an operation. And, uh, and the operation fused a steel rod to my spine. And this is me uh, after I came out of the uh, body cast. And uh, that's me now inside. Uh, that's who I was that I couldn't ever really show anybody. Um, and like all young girls, there were lots of bodice rippers out there. And you probably saw them. Um, I also loved bodice rippers. And there's one of mine. And I, I was very, very into the world of weird and eerie and creepy. Um, that was my world. Uh, I spent a lot of time with these, these magazines teaching me. <laughs> uh, and the commonalities of monsters and artists often work hunt alone, are often feared by conformists and other villager types, often disappoint <laughs> friends and family. You know this. Um, can challenge gender roles, extreme self-doubt, sometimes wear cool clothes. <laughs> Can lack business sense. No. Instincts play a key role. Historically have had tragic endings. Mm. Fully committed to pursuits, passion, can upset the social order without even trying. Resentment of social norms. Ability to look into the darkness and see things. Ferocity. Hunger to manifest the unknown. And that's me uh, at about the age of 14, uh, cross-dressing um, because I just loved it. And I had just found out the word lesbian. And it uh, was quite a shock. Uh, you know, it's, I say to my daughter and people of the younger generation, you don't know how, what darkness we stupid boomers lived in, so please lay off of us, <laughs> OK? <laughs> please, I'm begging you, just understand that we were raised in total darkness. It's like we're people who are bl out blinking in the light. And you can't expect us to adjust that quickly. We're not that fast. I, I am constantly begging uh, my daughter to forgive me for the stupid things I say and do. Um, but hey, I'm not alone. In, and this is Toulouse-Lautrec. I attended an exhibit of his, and he is fabulous. And it was in Paris. And our Art Institute, four of the best paintings at that exhibit came from the Art Institute of Chicago. And I really felt like going up to the French, although they wouldn't have understood me, and saying, do you realize where this painting comes from? It's our painting. you know. And <laughs> that would have been obnoxious, but I really was proud. And then blackness. Well, I like to talk about this because it's just straight up honest. Uh, from about the age of 16 till um, about the time my daughter was born, I suffered incredible clinical depression, addiction, um, and uh, was hospitalized, had many difficulties. And I say that to you right now because I want to speak right to the place where you might be with that. And that is, don't give up. It could get a lot better. Don't give up even if it's hard, even if it's so hard and you can't imagine anything better, hold on, things get better. So they did. 
I had this wonderful person who looks like one of those creatures in the Angoulême uh, thing. <laughs> she is actually beautiful, uh, but at this moment, she was like jaundiced and not okay. But see, I told you, she got, she got prettier and um, more normal. And uh, one day, uh, when she was six years old, a girlfriend threw a party for me. And my daughter, who was kind of prescient, said, don't go. Don't go. She was really serious. She was just a little six-year-old, so I was like, Psh. I should have listened. I didn't. I was bitten at that party by a mosquito. And three weeks later, I woke up in the hospital with a very nice physical therapist kneeling by my bed saying, you know, we um, have been coming in and we have been pricking your feet with needles. And I said, really? And uh, the physical therapist said, yeah, but you see, the problem is you didn't know it. And I was paralyzed from the waist down. And I had lost the use of my, of my right hand, my drawing hand. So while I was there, of course, uh, I got visited by the angel of death which was an enormous disappointment to this day, is one of the biggest disappointments of my life, because I was expecting lycra and feathers and like silk and maybe even like black rhinestones or something. Instead, it was just like a filing cabinet from the 1940s. And its entire poetic discourse with me was, are you in or out? We need to know for our records. That really was all it said. <laughs> it was not very romantic. Uh, and I was really looking for romance. I think I'll just put that down like that. And, or I'll put it up here, and then the little thing that's attached won't go away. No, nah, it's okay. It'll be all right. So thank you, though. Um, so uh, later, uh, it felt bad. I was sick for a long time. And these wonderful people, to, oh, no, hello. I did the wrong thing. Oh, yeah, now you know stuff is coming. Um, <laughs> I, um, I had wonderful helpers. I had, uh, my mother allowed me to live in her dining room. I was a single parent, so I had a six-year-old child. I did not know how I was going to live. Uh, my daughter was a tremendous support. Um, what ended up happening is that my, my father had died just not too long before, the year before, which was pretty terrible. And um, there was a family show that had been planned at the Evanston Art Center, which is where I was living at the time. And I had no art for it. Um, and I, of course, couldn't really draw. So uh, I sat at a drafting table. I wheeled up to it with, in my wheelchair. My daughter got a quill pen and dipped it in ink and taped it to my hand. And we drew this drawing together because uh, she wanted to have something to put into the show as well. And what she drew was really important. What she drew was I drew this wheelchair and this little chair that was her little chair. And she drew me getting up out of that chair because she said, you're going to. The doctors had said, you'll never walk again. The head of neurology at the most major hospital in the Midwest had said, it's over. You're, you're paralyzed from too high up in your vertebrae. So my daughter knew different. And um, I wheeled down to the Art Institute. And uh, I ended up getting a degree there and studying writing. And I thought I was going to be an animator, but I was too, uh, I'm too impatient. It was like, I couldn't wait. I mean, if you think graphic novels are tough to do, <laughs> animation is just like, I don't know. I don't know how animators do it. It's, it's, and plus, it was too frustrating for me. Uh, but um, wait a minute, did I pass something for you? Yeah. I want to tell you how I stole. Hi, child. Um, <laughs> I, I just did whatever it took to stay alive. A lot of it was um, stealing, frankly. Uh, I was working on the book. Uh, when I graduated, I was very lucky. I got a uh, $10,000 uh, grant from the Toby Devin Lewis Foundation, and that allowed me to have six months to work on the proposal for the book. And I will tell you something. Um, that was the greatest gift. And if I could change the rules, I would make it so that everybody who graduates college gets $10,000. Well, it's, it makes total sense, especially for artists because it'll give you that time to build that show, to write that book, uh, whatever it is that you have to do, and you pay for it anyway. Might as well get it and be able to do something with it and prepare for it. Can you imagine the creation that would happen if we just did that with every single BFA student, every writer, every filmmaker? Things we would make, and we could do stuff like that. We'd just have to change our vibration a little bit. 
So uh, this is the book that came out of that, and I wanted to show you. This was the cover I had imagined it would be on the, on the book, and very fortunately, Jacob Covey, who was a great designer at, at Fanographics, said, well, um, I think you could do something different. Uh, and I'm really glad he did, because I like that better. When the book came out, of course, the next big hole that I fell in is that the book was seized by pirates. Now, if you don't think that's true, it's actually true, and it's hilarious, isn't it? Like, my book was seized by, well, we don't know really what happened to it. That was the fear, that it was seized by pirates. But what happened is that the shipper went bankrupt um, midway, went my book in the Panama Canal. So all of the uh, first uh, edition are, have a slight wave to them because they sat on the water for a couple of weeks while my publisher uh, looked and looked and hired a detective to try to find the book. Yeah, and I thought I was in the clear. Poverty was over. All right. And uh, I went to Miami Book Fair, and apparently uh, Art Spiegelman had, had seen the book. And I didn't know him from Adam. I was stealing, um, I was, oh, that's me again. I was stealing uh, uh, um, appetizers. I was just going around and literally just, uh, I was following the guys, because I didn't know you got money. I was so stupid. I didn't know that you got money when you went to a fair. So I was really hungry and I had a bag of pecans. And a friend of mine, Kurt, and I were like really kind of like just like blocking them so that we could take all the appetizers, because we were hungry. And I got this pile of little pile of appetizers and I sat down at a picnic table and I started eating them, and somebody across from me said, well, who are you? And I was like, oh, God, I'm going to get thrown out of this place. And um, he, I told him who I was, and he looked at me, kind of cocked his head, and then he talked to the guy next to him, and then that, that guy talked to this other guy. And that other guy he talked to was that guy. And that guy literally reached across the table and grabbed my hand and said, wow, I liked your book. And, you know, I was like, and who are you? And then he said, <laughs> <laughs> And then I was like, I don't know, I think I cried a bunch or something. Anyway, <laughs> there I am. Uh, I am, you know where I am, I'm in front of the Louvre. And I got to be there for uh, three, four months this, this last year, last year, and do a residency there. And I got to walk around and be a big shot. And I got to, like, they let me lick things. No, they didn't really. <laughs> I didn't get to lick the Mona Lisa. I was totally messing with you about that. Anyway. <laughs> But here you see, um, here you see the Vesica Pisces. Then there is our guy Jesus coming down and talking to Saint Francis, and that's important, right? And of course, I love the monsters. I got to take, uh, uh, do a workshop with people and talk about monsters in paintings, and they got to draw themselves into paintings and go into paintings. This is a sexy damn painting. I love this painting so much. It's by uh, Joachim Vedevel, and it, it look at that thing. And what I love so much about it is, yeah, she's pretty sexy, but you know, you usually see this um, where the, the knight is fighting the monster. You usually have them be the, the big players in the painting. And instead, she is. She's this great elegance. Of course, I love the monster. He looks kind of cool, doesn't he? And oh, isn't that beautiful? When you think about shells, think about what the painter is telling us in terms of shells, our body, our skeletons and shells, and it's sexy. I mean, hello. Anyway, um, and then once again, shells. We're talking about this passage, the way we inhabit this, this body. We live in this life. We manifest in this life, and then we move on. Um, and there's me. I got to draw the whole time. I got to come in all the time, not at night, sadly. And I got to draw, and there I drew myself as that monster, uh, which was fun. And I just threw this one in, because it's a great monster. I don't even. Angra. Okay. Um, I love this painting. It is really about the hemispheres of the brain. If I had tons of time, I would tell you, but the artist painted his name here, as the, and you would imagine perhaps that's his foot. Um, this whole painting is about left, the left. It's about unreason. Here is your Vesica Pisces again. Look at that. It's telling you, this painting is telling you that we are living in the monster is unreason, which is beautiful, imaginative, possible. This world, Thebes, is reason. So we're being led, we're being told to leave. What does the, what does the you know, that's my drawing of it that I drew, and I'm not done with it, at the Louvre. 
So what does she say to him? Okay, Dee's showed me a picture, uh, the, uh, and you know that she says, the Sphinx says to Oedipus, the riddle, what creature has only one voice and yet is four-footed, two-footed, and then later three-footed, right? The answer is a human who crawls on all fours as a baby, then who walks two-footed as an adult, and then uses a walking stick when old. And usually you get taught that that's the end of the story. He bested her. Yay! You know, he's so cool. No, he's just a dick. Um, <laughs> so is the riddle, um, uh, wait, I'm not even, meant to make me see that I'm a strange creature just like you? See, that's what I think the truth of it is. That's what she's saying to him. She's saying, have some humility. Okay, um, because cause to be honest, I'm scared of the part of me that is you. And she says, oh, you stupid villager, of course you're scared because the part of you that is me is a much bigger part of you than you think, which is our problem right now in this time, today, in this country, in this world. Okay, um, that's why you poor weak mortals have to tell stories about outwitting and killing us monsters over and over again in all your mess. I think it, I hope that it ended up like this. OK, that's what I hope. But um, now, have you ever seen this movie? Yeah. Fabulous movie. Now, this is an interesting movie, made in 1945, right? So the war has ended, and this movie failed, because nobody wanted to look at what they'd done. <laughs> nobody wanted that. And let me see if we, yeah, OK. It is about this gentleman, Dorian Gray. And why am I showing it to you? These are beautiful shots. This whole film is made almost like by a painter because there are tons of shots that, like this one with this, the, the shadow that he's casting and he's read, reading through, uh, you know, a bottle air. And it's just, the whole movie I would recommend, there's a beautiful, um, what's her name? Angela. Angela Lansbury, thank you. And this painting, the painting that is in the movie, hangs at the Art Institute of Chicago. And it is one of my loves, one of my early loves. A little aside, Ivan Albright's paintings, you know how very, if you know his work, you know how very dense they are with little brush strokes. My mother, as a student at the Art Institute, would say that he would come in with his palette and set it up in front of one of his paintings and go, it's not quite done, and just start painting on his painting, which I think is kind of great. And I, I think this is an important quote. I sent my soul through the invisible, some letter of that afterlife to spell, and by and by my soul returned to me and answered, I myself am heaven and hell. If we only understood ourselves a little better, um, there's my beautiful Medusa. I got to take this at the, um, at the Uffizi, and I did not know it was on a shield. Of course, that's the myth that, you know, her head is cut off and put on a shield because she's an object. And I think about her, when I was a child and I heard this myth, what I thought is, she's this creature, she's all alone, and somebody comes to visit her, and she gets to watch them slowly turn to stone, and how painful that would be, when she probably just wanted to talk to them. Like, do we ever have empathy for the monster? Do we ever think about what it would be? Well, of course not, right? So I, I, I this is an original drawing. Uh, You know, you're a dick. You really are. <laughs> Super dick. And he's, got, he's just this such, such a total dick. But, um, and you too. I mean, you really are. So I think, um, and I like something. Whitney Porter said something wonderful to me. Uh, she said, we have to remember. Isn't that great? Remember. To collect our members and reattach ourselves. We have to reattach Medusa's head, especially as women especially as women. This is what we must do. And as all people, you know, we're dehumanized by the same system, men and women. And we have to fight for that, for each other. We have to partner with each other and fight for each other. And fight for people who are people of color. And fight for everyone to have the same. Because you know what? The, the secret of all the shit I'm trying to get at with you is we're all connected. We're one organism. We're one group. We're one people. If, when they do the studies, they find out that we know when people are watching us. You know, we, we, uh, you know that, that, that feeling of being looked at? That we actually do know. We are connected. And the time has now come for us to stand up. OK, so we must remember. And hello. You know, I'm, I'm OK with that. I mean, I'm, not, I'm a nonviolent person, but it's kind of cool. So here we are. 
This is the moment. What has happened? You know how, how really prescient Mary Shelley was. What are we facing now? Where is the Frankenstein now? It's called AI. And we better hope that it wants us to like it and it wants to be like us. Because if it doesn't, we are so screwed. No, we really are. That sounds like science fiction talk, but it ain't. The future is this. The future is this interaction, OK? And it's one of the most important interactions any human being can ever have with himself. And so, hello. That's right. And then, hello. That's, that's the truth. The truth is, we are the monsters. There are no monsters. We are the monsters. All of us. That's what we are. Isn't it cool? Now, what's the problem? Why are there any problems? Because there are villagers. And villagers don't really get it. They don't understand that, in fact, they are monsters. They're just angry monsters who don't want to look inside. They look outside to find the monster, and they chase it. They're always chasing a thing. They're always chasing a thing, and chasing a thing, and chasing a thing, and chasing a thing and chasing a thing, and chasing a thing. Remember that. Remember vibration. Remember that you can change this. You, every single one of us, was sent here to be here now. I was in the middle of that fever thing, and I had this vision. I thought, how can I do all this? You know, my hand, I had drawing. That's all I had. I, did, I was a sculptor, and I had this exercise I did for my hand. This is it now. This is all I've got left. But it was enough to make the book, OK? My hand at that time was a claw, and I was so broken. I was so broken because I'd lost the only thing I'd ever had in my whole life, which was the ability to draw. And I said, what about this? And then I imagined that I was this little light looking down over the entire expanse of my life and that I said yes to this whole thing. And I said, if that's true, then the strongest people are the people who have the hardest lives. And you know, we are here right now. I believe we chose this. I believe we know it's a fight. I believe we know it. But we're here because we matter now, and our vibration matters now. <coughs> and you got to start vibrating. And that means you go to your studio and you make your art. And if you think, I'm not at that protest, or I'm not doing this other thing, no. The energy you produce as an artist, as a writer, as a creative person who organizes and makes beauty in the world, that shit is important. It is what we're made out of. It is what elevates every single one of us. So I just wanted to say that to you. That's what this whole convoluted uh, series of digressions and asides has been. And thank you. have time for questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have time for a couple questions. Uh, does anybody have a question for Emil? Yeah, you better ask one. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of your favorite contemporary monsters or like monster love stories? Like, did you get to see Shape of Water and things yeah, like that? And I loved that. I really did. Uh, a, a friend of mine bashed it really badly. And I was like, yeah, I get why you don't like it. But I loved it. I, I totally loved it. Um, I don't have a television. Otherwise, I couldn't make books. You know, I'd be watching the television, probably. Um, so I understand there are a lot of wonderful things on the television that are monstery. Um, yeah, I would say Shape of Water was one of them, definitely.
Well, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you for sharing that story, like share, just sharing all of these stories. Like it's been really inspiring. Um, as far as my question, what changes did you notice from before like you lost function in your hand versus after? Like, did you notice any change in your art, any change in how you, because for me personally, like I kind of like I recognize myself through like what my hands can do. So like, were you still able to see yourself as clearly as you were able to see yourself before? That's a great question. It's, it's a good one. And I, I think um, the reason I did the book the way I did is because I knew it would take a lot of small marks to create form. And I didn't have the same kind of, uh, I could make those small marks, but making larger marks was harder. And uh, so I just tried to suit what I was able to do to what um, I could, what I could create, you know. And did it change how I saw myself? Um, I think I still saw myself the same way, but you're right. There is something that happens to you where you realize that you know, I used to do very fine pencil drawings, and I realized I couldn't do them anymore. And uh, that was hard. And uh, yeah, in a way, maybe that made me observe myself differently. I'd have to think about it, but it's a great, it's a great thought. I don't know. Jonah? I got a question from the internet. Um, someone is asking, uh, well, what are the tools cool. you use? Uh, what did you start off using, and then what do you use now when you create, please? Well, for this book, I used big pens and flare pens, uh, almost exclusively. Um, and uh, I use all kinds of things. Nobody's seen my ink drawings or any of that, and uh, I will do those at some, at some point. I'll bring all that out. Is that enough of an answer? I hope so. I can't speak uh, for them beyond that question. <laughs> So this is kind of a follow-up. <laughs> Has Bic finally given you those brown pens, or do you still have to buy the giant packages? That wow, stick in the brown you pen? know my secret. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to the store and spend so much money buying all these pens to get that one brown one. Uh, and uh, and also they have other colors that there's only one of in orange. They're such I don't know. Anyway, I love them. I really love them actually. Um, I do. They've been, they made a pen for me in France that has uh, Anka's face on it. Yeah, but it, it was a limited edition thing. So, but that was really nice. Yeah. I would love them to make me the sponsor of Bic. <laughs> and I would, I would be on a, like a cardboard thing holding my pens. Yeah, that would be, really, <laughs> be so cool to walk around. And then they could send me hundreds and hundreds of pens. And I would be so happy. <laughs> I mean, I would. I would, I would take you to the pen bank. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would. I love pens that much. I would, I would be with pens and a thing. Yeah. Hey, I'm Emil. Hi. I know you. I know you. This is Nick Susanis, <laughs> who you are also going to uh, be talking to. Yay! Woo! Uh, Nick! Woo! This is why I shouldn't ask a question. Um, I just have a funny question. Um, do you know Frank Santoro's? Uh, his diagramming of comics pages. There's probably some scholars that do. No, I'll send them to you, but they're concentric, sir. I mean, they're uh, Venn diagram circles that then get the most activity around a comic. Has anybody seen them? Am I alone in this? There's a handful of you. I'm not sure I believe it, but I share it with my students each year, and um, you'll appreciate it. That's okay. all. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. All right. I like diagrams. You do. I they're usually I see. wrong. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm I like Frank a lot, so I'm not going to say any more, but, um, but I think you'll get a kick out of it. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. Hi. Hi. Way in the back. Um, I just wanted to know what kind of comics you're reading now and what comics you're thinking about. Wow. You're going to get me to confess the truth. Um, <clears throat> when I'm working, I almost don't read anything um, except research stuff. Uh, I don't read any comics because I think I just... Okay. I'll, I'll just tell you that. Self-doubt thing, I'll just be like, this is the best comic. Why am I even trying? I, I don't, who, this, I have to talk to this person. They're so great. And then I will, you know, I'll have self-doubt. 
And also, yeah, I can't do it. So I have a big pile of comics that people have given me, and I'll be reading them. I'll, I'll be staying somewhere nice someday, maybe Spain, and I'll, I'll just have comics with me as my friend, and we'll be together eating paella. And <laughs> it'll be great. I'll be reading in cafes or something. I don't know. That's a dream. Sorry, I can't. I love a lot of things I see out there. I love a lot of, I love to read Linda Berry's new book, you know. I hear it's very good. There's so many things I'd love to read. Berlin, Jason Lutz's book, I'd love to read that. Haven't yet. Yeah. Um, so this was going to be a really boring <coughs> yes or no question, but I'm going to try to make it less boring. Um, I guess, how did you come to decide to do the book as sort of in the form of a notebook? Um, was that something you always intended to do, or was it something that you sort of came to as you're working and thinking That's like, oh, this question. makes sense? I can only tell you this much, and I, without outing anybody, somebody, oh, do I do this? I don't know. <laughs> Through a series of unfortunate events, um, all the notebooks I ever worked on as a kid went away. They just were gone. And um, I had one left that I found recently, and I almost scanned some of the drawings on it for you guys. Um, then I forgot, so I'm sorry, <laughs> next time. Um, and so it was that loss that really, I, I mourned the loss of that, and so I recreated them in a way with this book. You know, uh, it's not exact, of course. I, it, it's, it's a story that's changed. I like to say uh, these things never happened, but the story is true. You know, so it's, uh, the heart of the story is very true. And um, the notebooks are back. Uh, thankfully, everyone in this room knows better, but there is this idea that uh, comics are kind of an inferior format, uh, and also the monster media is often looked down on. So my question is, do you ever kind of look at the reception of your book and kind of relish in it, like, see, like the... <laughs> <laughs> well, we're still miked, so there's, so there's so many things I can't say to you right now. Um, <laughs> suffice it to say that there have been people who were really discouraging to me. And um, they were in important places, and uh, not relatives. Um, but I um, have seen their faces when they look at me, and it's kind of like confusion, <laughs> um, anger, um, kind of a remorse. There's a certain amount of remorse there, and uh, I take. Uh, no pleasure in that whatsoever. That's a total lie. I totally take pleasure in that. <laughs> <laughs> pleasure in that. Uh, and, I, and it's kind of funny. Uh, but, um, you know, it's like every good thing in the whole world, uh, comics. Uh, I was told, you know, you're, 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 nobody's going to take you seriously because this is not serious work. Well, I thought it was, you know. So, uh, um, you know, we go through this with, the way that uh, people of color have been received, the way women have been received, the way that people are underestimated as having power and or a medium, uh, which is really, I mean, I guess, is comics a medium? I think it's just writing and just drawing. I mean, I think it's already writing. It's, it's art. It's both. It's more. But um, there is this way that something good is often looked down upon. And I think that's because we're under an envelope uh, we're under a, uh, we're enveloped and under a blanket of fear, as a culture. That fear is in our television. You know, you're going to get hemorrhoids. You're old. You have this thing. You know, the war, the thing, the other thing. Serial killers. Let's say You know, it's like fear. It's the fear channel. Like any time you turn, there's more and more fear, which is really why I can't watch it, because I don't want to be afraid. I, I'm afraid enough. You know, um, but I think fear. And I think people in writing are afraid of comics because they know that we will just absolutely kick their asses with this <laughs> medium. And thank you. It's the truth. And um, sorry, writer, textual writer people. Um, really? <laughs> um, so anyway, I think that's, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Hi, quick question over here. Sorry. Um, 
Hi. Uh, so, uh, first of all, um, hi from another person that grew up in Uptown. Um, I, oh, I grew up on um, the intersection of Carmen and Marine Drive in one of those of course. co-ops, uh, like by Foster Beach. So. Of course. I yeah. know where you were. Yeah. Sure. Like, yeah. So, hi. Um, but also, um, a lot of what you said towards the end of your talk with monsters and AI reminded me a lot of Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. And I was curious if you read it. I think it might be super Five. interesting. Um, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto. Ford Manifesto. Cyborg Manifesto. Cyborg. Cyborg. I thought you said sideboard. Sideboard. <laughs> and at first I thought you said sidewalk. I'm so deaf. <laughs> Deafness is so cool because you hear things that didn't happen and then you make up stories based on the stuff you heard, <laughs> which is what I do a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, cyborg. I love that manifesto. Yeah, I think it might be, yeah, it goes along with um, especially your maybe thoughts on like queerness and like us as monsters, and but instead of explicitly monsters it's specifically seeing cyborgs as like revolutionary i know yeah i know i love them anyway whether they love me or not i love them yeah cyborgs very cool okay i will i will look that up thank you i see a hand oh. hi thank you I had a question about, a little bit of a technical question, and I imagine you may have been asked this a dozen different times in a dozen different ways, but you have such a unique art style, and I can't imagine the time and patience that it takes to shade such big areas with such a fine point line and all these different colors. So I'm curious as to how you cultivated that style and, and how you practice it. Uh, I think I was always doing this. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was a poor kid. My parents were artists and we had some supplies, but generally I would end up with the big pens and my school notebook. And I just tried to make the most out of it. I loved those four color um, pens that clicked. I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I, think, I think I child orgasm the first time I saw them. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is, ah! You know, I was like, this is everything, it's four colors, you know? <laughs> I'm in love. Um, and I didn't have much more than that. I, I, you know, I didn't have much more than that kind of stuff. And so, I think it was about it, it's about not having and just making do. You know, which I think some of the best stuff comes out of that. You know, for yourself when you find yourself in a place of con um, a constraint. You know, constraints are really wonderful places to be. Um, you know. I love the fact that uh, this, this book, uh, apart, apart from everything else, is like a love letter to art, just in general, but all art, high art, quote unquote high art, and then the low art with the, with the Monster Magazine covers. But the, when you're reproducing the paintings from the Art Institute and things like that, do you get a different feeling when you're reproducing something that you've seen versus something that is coming from inside you? This is Jean Cannenberg, who is an artist and uh, writer as well, and lives in the same city that I live in, yes. Uh, amazing, I love your work. And I, you asked me, do I get a different feeling when I'm doing it? A different feeling from uh, the horror Be covers and the paintings? Or, or just between the, doing the paintings and then kind of doing the narrative portions of the book. Your own, like, what comes from your own head versus what you're when you're observing. Taking through, right. Yeah, the, uh, the process of observation. Um, my father was really strict about art. He was like, a, you know, observe, observe. You know, did you look? Did, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you would get in trouble. You know, uh, we would get in trouble for not properly observing. Um, or knowing who an artist was, you know, that kind of thing. I, uh, I think you, what you learn it's the best thing in the world. If you don't do this, if you don't draw, still sometime, just for snicks, go to a museum and sit and draw a painting. Because there is no better way. It's like taking apart a toaster when you're that geeky kid who has to find out how things work. This is the way you find out how a painting works. And a painting is just like any other anything. It has a system and a mechanism, and it has inner workings. And they re it's really true. And you'll be amazed at the sh stuff you'll find doing that. I find stuff. I see things I didn't know were there. I didn't understand things about paintings until I draw them. And then I, oh, I see. Her face is essentially a mirror of the flower 
and the, you know, and all of a sudden you see all the re repetitions and the triangulations and the compositional brilliance of it. It kind of feels like you're in the artist's head when you're doing that, the other artist's head. Yeah, eating their brain like a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's good. It's a good brain. It's, it's flavorful. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I have another one from the internet, if that's okay. Wow. Um, was your drawing and love of art appreciated while you were a child in school? Did teachers appreciate your love of drawing? Well, um, I was that kid who could not play, who could not skip, who could not run, who could not do all these things. So I told stories. That's what I did. I told ghost and horror stories at the school yard gates so that I could have friends who would stay by me. And I did it to you. I, I did it to you. I made a cliffhanger ending so that you would stay with me. And you did. <laughs> and I shouldn't have told you I did that, but I did it. Um, so, um, unhappy child. Um, so, I would draw on all of my assignments. I would try to do a report about human sacrifice if I could, and I would draw the actual human sacrifice. I remember doing this, and I remember uh, the puzzled look of my teachers, but I also remember occasionally my reports would go missing. And uh, didn't know who took them, whether it was the teacher or another kid. My art projects were, were stolen by other kids sometimes, which I can, you know, my mother, I told my mother, I'm really upset. And she said, no, no, theft is the highest form of compliment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Still yet one more, if that's okay. They're from the internet? Yep. That's so cool. People watch live streaming. <laughs> I was like, I, I can't believe this, like, it's not napkin folding. You know how, like, there's those YouTube videos that have two views? I mean, I was like, uh, I might be that video with the two views. But no, that's good. So the question is, uh, are you competitive? What other creators do you benchmark yourself by or find uh, that you would aspire to compare yourself with to be? I was really competitive probably before I had a brain injury. And that's an interesting thing that I, I think I got a little more psychic and I lost my competition because I think I saw so from so far above the earth in a way that I realized what the truth was. And that was that I'm here to tell a story and I'm giving a gift and you can only do your own work. That's the only work you can do. And so I say that to people about their feelings about me just you do your own work, and that's all you were sent here to do. And that's what you, your mission is. So I don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Oh, there are times when I look, I'll tell you the, the, the truth. <laughs> I just found out how much a friend's book auctioned for, and I was like, bitch, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, okay, oh, the money, I was like, um, and she deserves it. Her book is fantastic. It's going to be fantastic. Now that I've told you that, I feel funny about telling you what the book is. I'd, pro I'd promote it, but now I told you she got a lot for it. It's not really anybody's business. But um, it is so great when people succeed, and I want us all to. You know, I want everybody to realize themselves completely. So, yeah. Internet says thank you. Oh. <laughs> AI. <laughs> it's a person, I think. Okay. Are there any more IRL questions or internet questions? I think we're done. All right. Looking good. Let's I'm give awesome. her a hand, everybody. Isn't he adorable? <laughs> he is 
he's just adorable. Let me go away. Oh, I know. <laughs> now he's now he's now he's uh, all shy. But really, he is amazing. And thank you, MSU, and thank you, Randy. Thank you to all those names right there who I've cursorily cursorily met. But you, thank you. Thank you, Emil. We're going to go get something to eat. So thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow, 1030 to 530. All the events are happening. Third floor. And a little on the second.